And a big part of the issue is, as you say, environmental, social, and governance, ESG, which was really a drive to get rid of uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. See, the environmental was kind of a big E on that. Uh, but we've had a bunch of uh, states that have said, hey, wait a minute. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to and watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Well, ESG is turning out to uh, not be good business for business. Who would have ever thought that could be possible? Certainly uh, not yours truly, but my next guest knew it all along, Steve Gorham. It's great to have you back. Hey, if you got a question for Steve, myself, about ESG or anything else, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. Steve, great to have you back. So what's going on here with uh, this ESG stuff? It looks like the big investment banks finding out this is not a profit boom. The only company making money off of this is Tesla because they're selling their uh, regulatory uh, tax credits, and we'll see how much that gravy train lasts for, right? They have two uh, big uh, tax credits, Tesla. Yeah, so we've had uh, BlackRock and Vanguard, J.P. Morgan, uh, PIMCO, other Wall Street firms that are pulling back from their climate change pledges. Uh, Several of them withdrew from a group called uh, Climate Action 100 Mm -hmm. in just this last month. And a big part of the issue is, as you say, environmental, social, and governance, ESG, which was really a drive to get rid of uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. See, the environmental was kind of a big E on that. Uh, But we've had a bunch of uh, states that have said, hey, wait a minute, Uh, Texas, uh, West Virginia, Florida, Mm. have all said things like, well, uh, we're not going to use any of our pension funds on your funds, our pension money, if you keep pushing this ESG thing. So they pulled back from that. And then the other thing that has happened is that the renewable energy stocks are in kind of a tailspin. There's an index called the Renix Index, R-E-N-I-X-X, which has a, a list of roughly the top 30 renewable energy companies in the world. It's, it's a stock fund index. It's been around about 25, 30 years. Well, that has been dropping. That's, it's down about 50% in the last three years, the Renix Index. Mm-hmm. And so we have many of these renewable companies that are just not doing well. And so... Uh, I think the uh, the big financial firms are going, you know, we're, we're kind of advising that they, they pursue these renewables and, and it's not working very well. <laughs> hey, you know, I learned a long time ago that the only purpose of business is to make money. All right. Do it legally, ethically, and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, and when they start with all this do-gooder stuff and woke stuff and equality and equity and all that, that's when their problems invariably begin. And why have they not figured this out yet, Steve? Well, I think there's tremendous public pressure, and we have people like Google and Apple and and Amazon all talking about how green they are and how they're getting to uh, uh, green electricity for their data centers and a lot of other things. Those things cost money, though. They they end up purchasing electricity at a higher rate, which impacts their stockholders and and shareholders. But it is it is in big part uh, to build their green image with the public. And as long as the public agree, uh, uh, thinks that green companies are, are adding something or doing something, they're going to continue to do this. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, so you know, we've got places like Exxon where uh, these, these folks have uh, gotten in place on the board. They're trying to get them to do all this stuff that, uh, yep. that they don't want to do. And, uh, is that going to change too, do you think? Well, the oil companies are under tremendous pressure. It's not only on the board, but uh, many of them are being sued. Uh, personally, li- uh, the the, uh, the suits are trying to make the board members personally liable for their position on uh, that human-caused climate change is not a problem or their past positions. So many of the oil companies have caved into this. The American Petroleum Institute uh, thinks you ought to have a carbon tax. It's really, really very sad. Our, our world runs on hydrocarbon energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. And uh, everything from our clothes to our, our smartphones uh, to the vehicles we use, not only how they're, they're manufactured, but how they drive, 
to the endless rows of plastic bottles in our in our supermarkets, to our, our medicines, which come from hydrocarbons, our uh, medical supplies come from hydrocarbons. I know about half the world uses synthetic fertilizer for our food, and much of the world uses tractors so using diesel as well. So our world runs on this stuff, and we're not going to be able to switch from it uh, quickly. Net zero is just not going to happen. Okay, so, but, you know, these plastic bottles and all this extra waste that we have, like going no. to fast food place, I mean, shouldn't we really be looking to get rid of that and minimize it? Well, we do have a problem with uh, uh, plastic waste in the oceans. It is often overstated, but there's about uh, 100 million tons of plastic, it's estimated, in the oceans, and we're adding about 10 million tons a year. Almost none of that comes from the United States or Europe. It's mostly from developing nations, uh, Far East, that sort of thing. So banning straws in San Francisco isn't going to have a real big effect. But we do need biodegradable plastics. But that is a real problem to solve, unlike the problem of, of trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to stop global warming. That is, A, not a problem, and B, probably not possible. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I see it like these just water bottles. It's like there's really not a great <laughs> market to recycle plastic, right? I mean, No, there isn't. A lot of it goes to the landfills. I'm a tap water guy. I'm not, uh, don't give me this bottle full of water. <laughs> yeah, and the people uh, who are uh, complaining are the ones drinking the bottled water, the uh, Perrier and the uh, the Evian and uh, and all that good stuff. But uh, yeah. But seriously, so should we be switching back to glass? Well, I don't think so, really. I think that the key is biodegradable plastics, things that break down in sunlight, you know, they might have a problem where you can't leave a, a, a jug of milk out in the sun. That wouldn't work too well. But but I think that's what we need. Those are more expensive, though, but the industry is working on it. There's some other big problems, though, too. One is discharge of wastewater. About 80% of the world's wastewater is discharged untreated into rivers, lakes, and streams. Seven years or so ago, the Olympic swimmers in, in Brazil didn't want to swim in the water down there. Brazil's just building their first water treatment plants. That's That, again, is a real problem to solve, not a big problem in the U.S. and, and Europe as well, in wealthy nations. Uh, let's solve that and quit pour, pouring all this money in to try and reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Okay. So, yeah, like, uh, I see it all over the world. You know, I was doing some research because I was in Asia recently, in yeah. Thailand, and, you know, most of the world does not have... a. Uh, tap water that is uh, drinkable, audible. Right. You know? Much of the world that we're not. About about 2 billion of the 8 billion people do not have real good water. Uh, I think that, I think the number is about six or 700 million that, that don't have access to clean tap water, but in other cases, it's not real good. Yeah, well, for instance, um, in North America, or in the Americas, I think there's yeah. four countries uh, where you can drink the tap water, not including... Uh, islands in the caribbean that is canada the u.s i think chile and um god I, the other country eludes me in asia that may be. what's that that may be yeah uh in asia there's only five countries where you can drink the tap water japan south korea singapore um and i don't remember the other countries but most of most of the other places, you got to treat the water. Um, yeah. They have filters. Like my friends in Thailand, they have a reverse osmosis water filter in their condo so they can drink the water. But, yeah. uh, you know, we, shouldn't we be thinking about drinking water, tap water, making that pure? Wouldn't that make a bigger difference than anything else these Those are, yeah. people are trying to do? Those are real problems to solve. And uh, we certainly need to do that. Uh, definitely the case. So rather than, again, again, the carbon dioxide thing. Did you hear what uh, Mrs. Uh, former Secretary of State and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton has called for? She no, called, I haven't been following she called, for us, she called for us to track, start tracking climate deaths. Oh. If you remember during COVID-19, we had a daily indicator. You could go online yeah. and find everyone who had a COVID case or a death in the state, mm-hmm. uh, in yeah. countries. Well, she wants us to start tracking climate deaths on a daily basis in support of policies. <laughs> the insane. Hey, so go back to the tap water. Four, co- okay. four countries in the Americas. Canada, U.S., Costa Rica, 
in Chile. In Asia, okay, much bigger population than the Americas. There's only oh. seven countries, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. Yeah. And, and the only other countries, well, Western Europe, most of that, uh, the water is drinkable there. And then Australia and New Zealand. I mean, this seems to be a lot bigger problem because so much disease comes from bad tap water. And But in any event, yeah. So It's a so big deal. Why don't we track deaths by uh, people who get cholera and dysentery and all these other diseases that come from uh, dirty water? Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Well, you know, there's, uh, there was a paper just written by Colin Carlson at Georgetown University, and uh, he, he said we've had 4 million climate deaths in the last 20 years. But if you look, do- if you look down into the paper, he says uh, diarrheal disease is, a re- is one of the reasons for climate is a climate death, or malaria is a climate death. And yeah. even, even cardiovascular disease, he calls a climate death. <laughs> So, you know, if you call any of those things a, a, a climate disease, you can call anything a climate disease. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, hey, the diarrhea specifically comes from, from water. We know that. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So if it's climate death, hey, let so I'll accept that uh, bad water is climate death. Fix it. <laughs> That's something we can fix a lot easier than anything else. Right. We've proven it. Um, you know, when the United States military sets up a base somewhere, the first thing they do is put in a water purification unit, right? Yep. I mean, yep. this is a uh, solvable, right? Yeah, important problem about, you know, your listeners might not know uh, why they invented tea in China about 2000 BC. They used right. to boil, they used to boil their water. And when you boil water, it takes, you know, little things out of it that make it taste good. So then they started adding tea. They added the uh, tea ingredients and that's uh, supposedly how tea was invented uh, early on, is because of boiling of water. Hey, so it's a perfect example of what you're saying here. It's like, you know, if we're going to uh, really look at this stuff and really uh, focus in on it, then, uh, you know, let's, let's get real about it. Where can we make the most difference? I think you spend a billion dollars on water purification in India or in Pakistan or wherever, you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck than anything else, right? Well, the whole climate movement is a tremendous misallocation of resources. The world is spending about a trillion dollars uh, right now on renewables, primarily wind and solar, some biofuels, when all these problems are out there to be solved. Uh, Not only water, but uh, uh, there's a number of diseases that kill a million people a year. Uh, we're, we're short of electricity. We have 700 million people that don't have access to electricity and about 2 billion that have blackouts and brownouts every other day. Uh, so there are a, a number of major problems to be solved that, that we need to be putting money toward and, and not toward trying to stop the planet from warming up. Yeah, well, hey, maybe uh, sanity is coming. Maybe the bottom line being negatively affected by these misguided uh, goals uh, maybe maybe that's going to bring some sanity here, huh? Yeah, we are seeing some signs of a green breakdown coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, where do we find your work? How do we connect with you on the web? Where do we get your books? Yeah, my latest book, Green Breakdown, The Coming Renewable Energy Failure. They can go to my website, Steve Gorham, G-O-R-E-H-A-M. Dot com. I'll send them a signed copy. Great book. Talks all about the energy transition. And it's got a lot of crazy sidebars in it, uh, like that uh, scientist in Sweden who wants people to eat human flesh to stop global warming, or the uh, the uh, 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 cosmetic surgeon in uh, California who is uh, taking human tissue and running his vehicles on it. <laughs> That's nice. Hey, you know, uh, why are they trying to get us to eat bugs, Steve? Uh, one last question. What is it? You know, why do they like, uh, why do they think uh, bug protein is so wonderful? That's what the UN says. It's uh, lower carbon dioxide emissions, plentiful bugs, and uh, <laughs> uh, no thanks. I'm not going to go into the, the bug eating business, but you know, <laughs> well, I, I won't go into that, but it is, it is another crazy, just another crazy idea to stop global warming. Oh, one more thing. Uh, there was a uh, a teacher in, in Utah that was actually feeding insects to her kids uh, in class as a lesson that they should be eating insects and the problems with beef and global warming. 
<laughs> okay, I like that. You know, like, uh, you know, that's where I draw the line. Okay, I want to save the planet, <laughs> but I'm not eating bugs to save the planet, right? Right. And and then, you know, you guess, well, I don't even want to get into the whole uh, carnivore versus, uh, you know, plant-based thing, but it, plant-based uh, philosophy seems to be a, an extension of this climate uh, thing, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, the UN says that something like 18% of global emissions are from agriculture. And if we eat less beef, we can stop that. We have less cattle uh, emitting methane from the nose end and the tail end. We can stop that. <laughs> okay, well, good. I'm feeling good about things now. Uh, if it were only that simple to solve the world's problems. And, uh, well, anyways, hey, got a question for Steve, myself, KL at com. And make sure you go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com, sign up for your free newsletter. A link to uh, Steve's site will be present. And we appreciate you coming back on, Steve. We'll talk to you again real soon. Okay, thanks, Kerry. All the best. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.